And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'd say to this mulberry tree, be formed by the roots and be planted in the sea, and a little baby would. Which, if you have no servant, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come into the field, come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me? So after I've eaten and drunk, and afterwards you eat, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded? I think not. So likewise, when you've done all those things which are commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. Amen. Let's just pray to our Father, we thank you, God, for the power of your word and the power of your grace, God, to change our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Tonight, that cleanses from all unrighteousness and sin. I pray, God, that your word will impact us in this place. Let it penetrate even the hard places and the crevices of our hearts. God, that we might find deliverance and freedom in Jesus. And we be praised together. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about the inevitable. Jesus is the one that says it's impossible that no offenses should come in verse 1. And he's basically saying that you're not going to live this life without going through some time of deep offense or deep violation from somebody or some circumstance that has happened. It is impossible that you're going to go through life but just kind of skating through and, and everything just kind of goes. If you're dealing with people, uh, if you have close relationships with people, uh, uh, things are going to happen. There are moments and times in life where we are going to be deeply hurt or deeply offended by somebody doing something, sometimes uh, saying something. Uh, this is simply the reality of living in a fallen world. We live in the real world. You know, people always accuse Christians of, oh, you just want to live in that kind of fairy tale world. No, you read the Bible, it's telling you about the truth. It's telling you about the way life really is. People do drugs and alcohol and run into fantasy worlds. What they're quite a bit available to them, but rather than deal with reality because they don't like reality. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to be blessed by God, and you're going to live the life that he's called you to live, but you're going to have to live with reality. You have to deal with things head on. You can't run away, you can't hide it, because uh, your life is being affected by your response. Amen. You know, I was thinking about how much of the Bible is dedicated to instructing us how to treat people when we're in a delicate or difficult situation. The Bible says so much, uh, uh, just telling people that, you know, this is how you treat them. This is what love is, because God was trying to help us to get through this life, not only with our faith intact, but with our heart intact, and with strength in our relationships. You don't have to be a victim, you don't have to be a statistic, but you can be a, a, an overcomer. The Bible says we are more than over, overcomers with him, and so this is a very important area of how we're able to do that. And on a macro level, God instructed Israel how to establish a moral infrastructure to a nation that he was beginning to raise up. He called them from slaves in Egypt. He brought them into the wilderness. And as he began to make them into a nation, and he gave them all of these, uh, these uh, uh, words uh, from the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Numbers, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the instruction that he gave Moses because uh, he was building a moral infrastructure for a nation, uh, a legal code that, by the way, is still relevant today, uh, how governments could be raised up, how a nation could be raised up, and a lot of that had to do with uh, how people treat each other. There's justice, uh, there's protection for the violated party, uh, there's uh, protections there, here, and everywhere, by implication for the whole community. And the reason that's so is because people have a way of violating one another. That's pretty obvious, right? That's why we have a police force. That's why we have a law. That's why we have judges and courts uh, and all kinds of things, uh, infrastructure set up uh, so that uh, in some capacity there can be some, ju some justice. And I say all that, which is pretty common knowledge to anybody with an adult uh, here, that that's the way life is, uh, to remind you that this is the way life is, and is that people tend very often to violate one another. And you're not going to get through life without it. It's happened. Jesus took it even a step further. He began to challenge the inner workings of the human heart. 
wasn't just the outward things he said. He said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, and so forth. But I say unto you that he, he wasn't just saying to just uh, respond to the outward things. He said, this goes deeper. It has to do with where your heart is. And make no mistake tonight that the issue in all of our lives is where is your heart? That is always the issue. It's not just uh, how it's playing out on the outward, uh, because Jesus knows that this is the, the true place of the kingdom of God. He made inward morality or inward righteousness as the true measure of a person's status before God. A lot of people are outward oriented. They compare themselves to people on the outward uh, things. They don't know other people's hearts uh, at all. But Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount uh, turned every, all of that on its head. Uh, and he said the real issue is always going to be what's going on in your heart. And God knows. And, and if you allow him to, he'll show you your own heart. Sam was said, man looks upon the outward. God looks upon the heart. You know, even people many times, even with the best of intentions, even the best of integrity, can still be deeply offended. In other words, you can even have, to, as I said, I'll say it again, best of intentions and integrity of heart, and sometimes things happen where you can become deeply offended and can actually take you off of, off of your direction in life. Now, I will say that uh, if your heart's in a good place uh, and God's uh, presence is with you, uh, it's going to be much more difficult to knock you off place. But it's still possible because, uh, you know, all of us have feet of clay. There's no, there's no superstars here. We all are, are, uh, have a flesh. We all have the ability to be deeply offended. But even more, all of us, and again, sometimes it's unintended, can bring offense to somebody else. Well, I didn't really mean it that way, yeah, but that's what happened. <laughs> Somebody said life is a full contact sport. And so we're all capable of being hurt and hurting others. My personal sense and belief is that the more healthy the, the soul, the easier it is, or I should say the harder it is for you to be offended, number one. And you're also very sensitive about being an offense. To me, that speaks of a healthier, mature soul. I remember the movie, The Crossing the Switchblade. I saw that movie so many times, I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> I mean, I've been around, I was around in the 70s, uh, in, in the 80s, and, and not, well, you know, we showed that, I've seen that movie so many times, it outreaches, like, you know, you could practically give the lines before they set them. But anyway, if you haven't seen that movie, it's about this, this pastor, David Wilkerson, going into the Bronx of New York. This is a true story, actually, back in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, where he began to work with the gangs there in the Bronx. And, um, uh, 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 and so that's what the movie's about, because uh, one man in particular, Nicky Cruz, got saved, and out of that, you know, a, a ministry was birthed, and, King Challenge today, and others had branched out from where was going. And it comes from uh, this story that this movie was across the switchway, but it comes to a climax in the movie when uh, Dave Wilkinson is preaching at this crusade that he has arranged with a few churches there, and there all these gang bankers there, uh, in, 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 and they able to preach to them, you know. Uh, and, and so they're kind of just watching him, a bunch of gangsters there on this side and on that side. That, and, uh, and uh, he starts to talk about love and forgiveness and all the things that make a Christian. Uh, and finally, somebody can't take it, but they stand up and say, what are you talking about, man? You want me to love better than this, uh, you know, this guy who I mean, opened his shirt and had a big old knife on him. You want me to love the one who did this? And then somebody stands up over here, somebody stands up over there, and they're ready to rumble. It's all falling apart, but, you know, I don't know, you know how movies do, they kind of change it, over drama, but, you know, it was all going to fall apart, there's going to be a massive brawl right there, and, uh, and, uh, and this is, I believe, I remember right, Nikki runs and stops it all, and hasn't there been enough, you know, fighting and all, all that stuff, but, but it's a reminder that sometimes people live with scars, and then they can't get past it. You can talk about love, you can talk about forgiveness, uh, you can do all of that, but uh, when, when it gets too close, you can simply say, no, I can't do it. 
It's impossible. I can't get past it. But we all add to that. Sometimes the closer the person, the deeper the offense. You know, the great majority of police calls to a violent situation are actually domestic violence. It's not random violence, it's domestic violence. People who know each other, people who are, you know, uh, and, and uh, it, gets, it gets out of hand. And because the offense goes deeper, uh, the closer you are to people. Families have been irreparably, uh, irreparably uh, fractured and broken because people simply can't get by and quit uh, an offense. How many times have we read about or heard about violence at a children's birthday party? That's a great place for violence and break out. You try to just celebrate a little child's birthday uh, and, uh, and celebrate, you know, the good thing, and yet factions of the family arrive, and there's, there's, some, there's some beef, uh, there's some hurt, uh, and next thing you know, all hell's breaking loose. Sometimes it's just drama situation. Other times it turns out to violence. Holiday gatherings, the same thing. It's a reminder that people don't get over offense. Jesus says, uh, speaking of our day and hour, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many is going to wax cold. What's iniquity? Well, iniquity is just a kind of fancy word for sinful, bad behavior. Unclean spirit or, 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 or bad conduct. The Message Bible says that because of the overwhelming spread of evil will do that, for, for many, the overwhelming spread of evil will do that in. Nothing left of their love but a mound of ashes. It's an interesting uh, interpretation. Nothing left of their love but a mound of ashes. That's the way a lot of people are living their life, man. Yeah, I tried that love thing, but you know, I've been violated and hurt. I don't got a lot of that no more. I'm just trying to protect myself. The uh, Pastor Ruby standard version would be of that scripture because folks are, are so sinful and selfish in the last days, there would be very little real love. But rather, a whole bunch of people hurting each other. Oh, you didn't like that one? Oh. Oh. <laughs> but that's basically what Jesus is saying, though, because the iniquity shall abound. You know, people think sinful behavior is just kind of, yeah, it's just the way the world is. Yeah, that's why the world's the way it is. I just kind of do what I like, man. Uh, if they don't like it too bad, yeah, just keep living like that and see how your life turns out. I'm just trying to say that uh, nobody cares care what I do, I just do what I do. Now, yeah, we know. And in your wake of all kinds of, of, of broken relationships and hurt feelings and, and so on. Let's talk about offense in the church a little bit. This is a very critical time for a child of God when we feel deeply offended in the body. And, you know, I don't know about you, when I got saved, I had a nice little honeymoon period as a Christian. You know, everybody in church was super spiritual. You know, how long have been saved, brother? Oh man, I've been saved four years. Went, wow, this guy, he's a man. I don't know if I can make it that long. You know, and um, you know, everybody was the Apostle Paul and Peter and John and Mary and Ruth and Esther and all of them. You know, all of them. And you know, your living's kind of like blinders on. Yes, I was in the real world in, in a way, but it's nice to be in a honeymoon period. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, each person's this towering spiritual uh, uh, a figure. And I remember the first time somebody in that church offended me, man. I was like, whoa, where did that come from? This guy was just a dope, an idiot. Uh, uh, he said these stupid stuff to me, you know. Uh, I didn't know whether to skin him or, or go tell him. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but to me, I was like, how can this happen in church? Well, because people are people in church, that's why. And some people in church don't even have a good attitude. That's another sermon. <laughs> you know, the word offense, the Greek word is scandal, scandal, life. Scandalizo. It's where we get our word scandal from. It 
literally means to trip up or a trip stick that's put in your way made you to stumble. And so the idea behind there is pretty clear. You're just kind of going on your way and somebody puts a little trip stick on you and now you're stumbling. You didn't think what's going to happen. You weren't expecting it. Wasn't up. You didn't, you know, you didn't have that inclination in your heart, to, but something was done to make you stumble. And this is the word that Jesus is using when he's talking about it's impossible, but that offenses will come. You're just moving along happily in good faith, like I was at that church service that I'm um, referencing. I was just moving along. I was happy. In fact, I'd asked for a tape. Uh, I was waiting for a tape of one of the servants, uh, and this guy blew up on me and said, You go get out of here. You don't have any business being in here. It's not ready. No, that was his response. We're asking for a tape. And, you know, I was, I was, uh, and this guy was in ministry and on platform and all kinds of stuff. I was like, what the, what the hell is going on here? I don't even cuss, but you know, what the hell is going on here? Come on. It's happening in this church, man. Thank God I had people just kind of reason with me and say, don't pay attention to him. He's an idiot. So I I agree with that, I said, okay. All right. <laughs> Let's hear more about what Jesus is saying in verse 3. He's saying it's impossible that offense will come, and I'll deal with it. Verse 2 in a moment. But go on to verse 3. He says, You need to take heed to yourselves if you're sinned against. Well, let me take heed to myself. Yeah, when you are sinned against, you need to pay attention now to your own heart. That's the last thing we want to do is when we're upset and angry is to now examine our own hearts. But Jesus says here very plainly that uh, uh, you're to take heed to yourselves at this point if you are sinned against. Tread carefully, pay attention to your own heart. So much of the Christian life has to do with soul or heart maintenance. That's why, by the way, I believe in Wednesday night midweek service. Because we need we do maintenance sometimes. I'm preaching on this subject tonight. And so much of the Christian life involves maintenance upon your own heart and upon your own spirit. That we might be able to conduct a kingdom business as the body of Christ. But if we're going to do that the way God wants us to, we got to keep our hearts right. Now Jesus says, that if you're sinned against by somebody, rebuke them. He says you're allowed. If they sin, you can actually tell them uh, uh, what, what, that they're wrong or, and so forth. But he also says you have to forgive them. But he says, if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day say, I repent, you shall forgive them. That's what he says. Well, if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, but seven times in a day returns, he's saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And so we think, wait a minute. After that second or third time, I say, man, you, you say you repented, but you ain't repenting, right? I don't know about you, that's what I would say. And yet Jesus is using an example here that's kind of extreme to make a point. What, is he, what point is he trying to make? That, that uh, you forgive somebody seven times in one day for sinning or violating you or offending you. Uh, and what's he trying to say? That's an extreme situation. It doesn't even happen like that. Uh, but what he's saying is uh, you always have to have a heart to forgive somebody. You cannot control what people do. All you can control is your response of your own heart to them. Yes, there's rebuking involved. Yes, there must be repenting involved on their part. But your part is you must forgive. You know, not handling the proper way only hurts us. In the Old Testament, Genesis 34, we have the story of a, of, a, of a daughter of Jacob named Dinah. And Dinah is the daughter of Leah. Some of you know the story of Jacob. Uh, he wanted to marry Rachel. But Uncle Lagos switched it up at the last minute and he gave uh, Jacob uh, 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 
Leah, his, his daughter, and so he worked another seven years to get Rachel, you know the story, but he had children with both. And uh, Leah's daughter was Dinah, and the scripture says that when they came out to, uh, to, to their new location, you know, she began to view the land, and, and the implication was is that she was ready to, you know, kind of adopt some of the values of, of, of the pagan nations that they were around, and you know the story, she gets mixed up uh, with the guy, and uh, the, 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 you know, strongly suggests that there was, uh, uh, you know, sexual activity going on, and he wanted to marry her, and, but her brothers were deeply offended, Levi and Simeon. And so the families were ready to clash. It was going to turn into a major conflict because of this deep offense uh, when this guy named Shishan violated her. And uh, Jacob, the father, because he had some wisdom, wanted peace. You know, people that want peace usually are the people that have wisdom. Anybody that's out there, and they get here, you don't know what you're talking about sometimes. Peacemakers are good, right? And so Jacob wanted to make peace, but they didn't care what their dad wanted. They were so mad and offended that Levi and Simeon incited a violent attack upon their neighbors, killed a bunch of them, and all a kind of manner of, 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 of chaos ensued. And uh, Jacob, you know, brought to had to bring judgment upon those two brothers. It was a lasting curse upon them because they would not deal with being offended. You know, if you don't deal with being offended in the right way, you're just bringing judgment on yourself. Sometimes the offended person can think, I don't even care. I mean, I know I'm messing things up, as long as I, I hurt them some way. Same is true of the story of Absalom. We were talking about this the other day. But Absalom rebelled against his father, David. And if you know the story, you can maybe trace it to how David may not have helped his sister, uh, uh, Tamar, when she was raped by her half brother Amnon in, in, uh, in 2 Samuel 13. Uh, and, and because David had his own issues going on at that time, uh, that he wasn't in a position even to judge that. Uh, and a few chapters later, his, his son is rebelling against him, trying to take over the throne. I've used this example, but it's, it's a nice analogy to this idea. Um, I remember hearing the, I believe he's a Hall of Fame wide receiver named Ahmad Rashad, talking about his very first game as a rookie. He was, um, he was, a, he was one of the new, hot, young rookie receivers, you know, one of the top picks in the draft. They were expecting a lot out of him. And the very first game with the Vikings, he's six feet four, he's fast, but he's already, they already think this guy's going to be a great, uh, uh, you know, addition to, to, to his team. And uh, he's a very proud and arrogant guy, you know, he thinks he's better than everybody. Like, you know how divas are, wide receiver divas, he's right there with that. He's talking about his first game, and he said the very first play of the game, he, this short little guy you know, named Pat Fisher, he's only five feet nine, I'm six four, he's five nine. He's by himself guarding me out on the wing. And I'm thinking, they're only going to put this guy on me? This little guy? And he's a little older. He's been in the league a while. He looks kind of old and crusty, like he's ready to retire. You think, this, this guy's going to guard me? And so he's telling himself this is the very first play of the game. Man, Fisher comes and hits him with, a sh with the, an elbow right to the side of his face mask and starts, you know, just roughing him up, trying to throw him down to the ground. And he's shocked. And he didn't know what to do, man. And so from that moment, he goes, this guy's going to try to pump me? And so the whole game, he's fighting with this little five foot nine coming back. Just personal battles while the play's over here. They're wrestling around over there. And, and uh, I've got to show him that guy. I'm ready for the NFL. But he says these words. I looked up. It was already the fourth quarter. And it dawned on me. I hadn't caught one pass. I was never open. This guy got inside my head, and I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing for our offense. And um, it dawned on me what he had done. This crusty old veteran had gotten in my head, picking a fight with me, and wrestling with me, so I didn't run the right routes, I wasn't paying attention where I should. I was just trying to win a personal battle, and ended up being completely ineffective as an offensive weapon in our offense. 
And I always remember that story, especially in subjects like this, because that's exactly the devil's plan. He's going to get you so locked in on one thing that's happened, or one person, or, or one incident to, that you're going to be, and you're going to be wrestling with that and battling that on some level every day, every, in your mind, in your spirit, to, and all of God is taking you away from what you should be doing, or what you should have been doing for a long time. And that's just uh, uh, the way life is. Another thing is, sometimes there's evidence when somebody's injured. Well, you know, when you're injured, um, normal things that you would do, normally they hurt you. Anybody ever have bruised ribs? You know? I've had bruised ribs a few times. A long time I ran my bike. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I'd like to say it was a spectacular fall, which I have, I have had, by the way, but this wasn't it. And so we turned around, I was barely even going to start. And I hit something in the road, the tire hit it head on, and it just threw me over my, threw me over my, uh, my bar and stuff, landed on my rib. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't, wasn't seem like it was that big a deal, but I landed right on those handlebars and it smashed into my rib, and I felt that for weeks. And so, anytime somebody came up and just, you know, hey, you know, did this thing, and didn't know about it, oh, man, oh, I'm sorry, man, what a man, I'm you know, Things that shouldn't hurt you, hurt you. And if you're offended and hurt, things are hurting you that shouldn't hurt you. You're hearing people's words in the wrong way. And, you know, or something is, you know, offensive that shouldn't be. Or just your way of relating to people, relating to life, but is uh, you know you're you're high strung. Yeah. Well, well. And so what happens is hurt people, as they say, hurt people. Yeah. Let me just make a note here before I close. Is that God, verse two, is when this is what you need to trust is um, Jesus says it would be better for those who go around offending people or hurting situations, hurting people. He's saying it better for them to hold on and let them lose only to the sea than he should have done one of these little ones. And so don't ever think that God's not aware of people who do damage people. Um, you know, that guy I referenced, you know, I don't say a lot about this, but he was so. Let's use a big word or an unused word here, obtuse, which means uh, just just um, kind of social moron is the way I would say it. He's so used to hurting you, he didn't even think about it. Well, that guy didn't end up in a good way. He he lost the best guy. Uh, even though he was looked like he was a preacher and a minister, he ended up doing his life ended up in a horrible, horrible way. And it's not a surprise to me because of something missing in how he treated people. And so God knows how to take care of his people, and God knows how to judge the wicked. Never forget that. And your place and my place is to trust him, because Jesus says it's better for them that they were thrown into the sea with a millstone around their neck than to go around offending people. Well, so let's look at one other truth here, and I'm going to stop very quickly. Back to the word of God. And the apostle said, verse 5, to the Lord, as he has said this, remember now he's telling them they need to forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. This is, man, what you're talking about is tough. Forgiving people who violated and hurt me. I need more faith. Help me to have faith and do that. I'm just praying for more faith. Have you ever had somebody tell you? I hope not. I'm just praying to God give me the faith to love you, you know, <laughs> or to deal with you. <laughs> but, you know, that's not, I hope you never heard that, because that's a really ridiculous thing to say. And so they say increase our faith, and Jesus goes into this story. First he says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, that's the smallest seed that's known, if you had that amount of faith, you could save this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted into the sea, and it will obey you. And so he says, faith, amount of faith, it's not amount of faith, it's real faith. It's not the amount of faith, I'm just not there yet. No, you just don't want to forgive. Well, I'm 
uh, God's helping me. No, he's not helping you. Forgiveness is a choice. He said, that's why Jesus, he's not being, uh, he's not being, you know, a, a sly here when he says this, uh, you know, oh yeah, if you had a face of mustard seed, you'd say, he's kind of mocking the whole idea that you don't have enough faith to do that. You know, if you had a, this amount of faith, you would say, if you fucked about a root, you would plant it into the sea and it's going to obey you. Uh, and so he's saying something very profound here. And then he goes into this parable about a serpent who's out doing his work, uh, and then he comes in from the field, uh, and uh, and uh, would you say would you say to him, come and sit down to eat? In other words, he's your servant, and so he's finished his job. Would you say, okay, now let me be your servant? Jesus is asking this question in this parable: Come and sit down to eat. But would not the master rather say to him? Okay, now that you're done with the outside work, there's some inside work for you now. Uh, uh, you're going to, you're going to, as he says, you're going to prepare me something for my supper, and you're going to gird yourself, and then after I've eaten and drank it, then you're going to eat and drink. Again, this is a master relating to the servant, and, uh, and, and, and um, he's making a point here. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise, when you've all when you've done all those things which commanded you, say we are in profitable service. We have simply done what is our duty to do. So there's a lot here. I'm going to, I'm going to simplify it quickly. But I believe Jesus is saying this, giving this parable, because when you're in offense or you're angry, you don't really care who the master and the servant is anymore. God says, "I'm your master. I can tell you." what to do by my word and by my direction. You are the serpent. I'm the master. It's commanded of you to forgive people. But something about being in the time of anger and offense, that we don't even care about all that. It's just religious dogma or doctrine. We're trying to deal with life on the level we want to deal with it on. And in that, uh, in, in that time, uh, we're forgetting who we are in God. Jesus is not talking about landscaping, though, and he's talking about something that's going to take deep roots. If you're not careful, that offense is going to take deep roots, and it's going to take a real miracle to uproot that out of your life. No. But faith and obedience are the same thing. When you, uh, when you and I obey God, if I faith, uh, amen. We're, we're obeying him when he tells us to do. See, we trade places with God when we don't like the way things are going. We start telling God the way things are going to be. He's no longer his word. We're telling God, well, no, I'm not going to do this and tell this. Or I'm going to start setting the agenda. I'll, tell, I'll let people know where I'm coming from now. That's a very dangerous place to be. When your theology has removed God as master, and now you're telling God the way things are going to be. That's what happens when people don't deal with offense in the right way. You believe you're in that position now because you've been hurt and violated. You tell God the way things are. We tell them by our decisions. We tell them by what we're not doing or what we are doing. We tell them in a number of ways. We say, yeah, I know what you said, Lord, but, uh, you know, at this point in my life, uh, all that's off the table. I'm going to do what I need to do. And we don't realize that we are all, as Jesus says, after you've done all the things that I've commanded you, say, we are on profitable service. We simply have done what we have to do. Let me just say this as I close. When you obey God as a duty, let me know what a duty is. A duty is when you don't feel like doing something, right? That's it. That's It becomes a duty. It's not just a, a desire. It's now a duty. Most of life is made up of duty. I didn't say duty. I said duty. <laughs> so, I had to throw that in a couple of but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of that too. But uh, um, you know, the duty is being is it's got to be done. It's got to be done. I I don't do it. There's going to be. Comfort.
consequences. And, and, uh, and so a duty to ask any mother about duty. She had to tell you. Ask any, any father uh, uh, supporting home about duty. He'll tell you. And so life is made up of this, and that's the word Jesus uses here when he says, after we've done what was our duty to do, you did your duty. And I'm going to tell you something tonight as I close. God knows people who are doing their duty in the will of God. It's not just a, about how you feel. It's about what you do. And because you do the right thing, because you do your duty, God rewards you in such a powerful way. God knows the depth of your offense. He knows the depth of your sorrow and hurt. And I'll tell you something else. He knows the depth of your duty as well. Who takes your commitment to him and your duty. And who raises that to such a high place. You know, when you talk about the book of Revelation, I'm going to stop. I really am. Um, but there are crowns. There's rewards. Mm -hmm. Ever seen a military guy that's well decorated? You know, just, just all over. Well, you can see that in the spiritual realm as well. People who are highly decorated because they've done their duty. And here's one of the hardest ones, but also one of the most rewarding. I want you to bow your head.